Welcome back, everyone. Today's podcast is going to be a very special episode. As we mentioned last week, we got to travel down to Austin for Consensus, where we were on a panel about how to spot a scam. This panel was arranged and moderated by David Z. Morris, the creator of the Crypto Crooks podcast that you should absolutely check out. And now, thanks to the Crypto Crooks podcast, we have the audio for that panel and we're allowed to share it with you. So without further ado, please enjoy How to Spot a Scam. A panel from Consensus 2023. All right. Thanks, and uh, thank you for being here. My name is David Z. Morris. I want to introduce my panelists, uh, starting with Cass Pianci on the end there and Bennett Tomlin. Cass and Bennett are the hosts of Crypto Critics Corner, a fantastic and widely respected and widely listened to podcast that digs into some of the, let's say, less sustainable elements of the crypto ecosystem. And then we have a, a really, really special guest here with us, Shung Suk Kong, um, who is uh, currently working on the Standard Protocol, but is here today because he is a former employee of Terraform Labs. And before the FBI rushes the stage and takes him away in handcuffs, he is here today because he left Terraform in, uh, uh, pardon me if I get this wrong, but in uh, June of 2020? It was uh, November 2020, yeah. Okay. So because, according to him, he uh, saw what was going on and didn't like it. So we have somebody who is inside and got out after getting a whiff of not such great things going on in the Terra and Luna ecosystem. And to briefly give my own resume, I'm the, the host and creator and writer and producer of a podcast called Crypto Crooks that looks into the history of major scams. It's awesome, and uh, you should all listen to it. Hyung Suk is a very important guest on our second season about Luna. I, I'll ask Cass and Bennett to talk a little bit about some of the stuff that they've been ahead of the curve on. Um, but I, by looking at Terra Luna's tokenomics and with help from a lot of other people's work, I wrote an article about the, the Luna death spiral two weeks before it happened. Um, so I, that's my pinned tweet forever is I predicted it and it went down exactly the way it was going to. So our discussion today is, you know, how we as, you know, whether skeptics, builders, journalists are able to spot the, the sort of bad signs of various kinds. And we'll, we'll get to all of the different stuff, but I want to start with Hyung Suk because you're you're really the star of the show here and i want you to talk a bit just briefly and sort of in a maybe the, at a high level about what you saw at terraform from the inside that really gave you pause and made you reconsider your your commitments there and and move on and do something else sure um it took four months for me just to move from terraform Labs to the other jobs uh because it was so terrible um so i'm just gonna go yeah, cr- that's, a, that's just to clarify yeah. he was only there for four months yeah, four months, four months. <laughs> yeah uh because there was so many flags out there so i'm just gonna go through some uh chronological order so so at the first day of Terra, so it started just meeting with the core team member called Nicholas Platias. I think he was a great guy. And that guy was just sitting on a, putting his leg on a desk and then just doing nothing. So I was just asking, so what's his role? And then he said, he's, she just said that he's Doe's friend. Um, and in the paper, um, he was supposed to be the head of the research. So it just kind of felt weird. And then he was kind of throwing a tantrum on that Koreans are kind of annoying because they can't understand what he says. Yeah. So, uh, so not the most mature person, perhaps. Yeah, it was. He was not. So uh, like very much like Do Kwan. So, yeah. So I went to the CTO, which is the oldest guy in the office. So at least I thought that guy would actually have a common sense. So. I went to him and then says, oh, maybe don't you think we should kick him out? And then he says that what he said was very funny. It was, it was there used to be a internal lawyer hired from that company. But then when Do Kwon came in, um, he fired that uh, woman. So uh, I was no lawyers, yeah, no more lawyers. So that was the first red flag. Yeah, uh, I had to find another job, but it just takes time. So. I had to build something, so it's a work ethic. So I started to work on Terraform Labs projects, but the managing, so the managing structure was composed of just one project manager who doesn't really know much about blockchain, but just try to listen to Do because that manager was just 
actually kind of very friendly with though, instead of just having a real skill. And infrastructure team was where I was at, and those were actually pretty much working hard. Um, they were kind of solid developers, but they did not have uh, any criticism on what the manager was trying to build. So unlike them, I was kind of different because I always wanted to make blockchain pretty much real thing. Um, I wanted to be uh, observed as the real builder. So I used to ask a lot of questions. And uh, one of the questions I started to ask on the mirror was that. Uh, mirror protocol. Yep. So back then, like mirror protocols once was called the harvest. Harvest was supposed to be a platform where Korean stocks are listed and pretty much it is on the blockchain and then they use that stock to, I think they were trying to become like a Robin Hood in Korea using the Cosmos blockchain. But then of course the Korean legal system did not allow that. So they were kind of having a problem. Maybe they were trying to use Daniel Shin to just to uh, pass with the, he's, you know, he's from Samsung family. So I thought they were trying to pass it with him, but I think they kind of failed. So, so I got kind of got frustrated and then just called the EJ, uh, one of our, uh, one of the TFL's internal employee and then said that, why not just make a MakerDAO structure with the, that synthetic stocks, just like synthetics did, and then just try to make a Uniswap out of it. And then maybe use governance to list new assets and then when I was saying that what EJ was doing, he was recording my voice and he was taking a picture of my uh, like blackboard. And then even after that, he went to Doquan and said something about it. And after one week, uh, Mirror White Paper was born. So there was a- So you wrote the Mirror White Paper <laughs> yeah. unintentionally. Unintentionally. So I was yeah. like, oh, what? So let's, let's leave it there for now. I want to hear Cass and Bennett talk. I, I think I, what I want from you guys is each of you choose one and let's stick to projects that have already failed or been prosecuted so that we don't get in trouble here. But what is your proudest intellectual moment of spotting something that was definitely a scam? But also I want proudest intellectual to be like over here, but I also want funniest obvious scam to be a factor in your choice here. So, uh, so what's the, the funniest, smartest scam that you've spotted? Bennett, why don't you go with uh, smartest? I think uh, Luna is. Yeah, those are, those are two different categories for me. I've got answers for both Looking of them. Looking for the act. The, the, the one I felt the smartest was probably Terra, because like two, three months before the collapse, I wrote a big research report where I went over the mechanism and where I raised issues with the long-term stability of the protocol and about those lies regarding uh, transparency around like Project Dawn unlocks and stuff like that. And then like two weeks before it collapsed, Cass and I did a podcast episode going over that same thing basically and talking about it and then it collapsed and our timing looked uh, like we were preternaturally good at making predictions. So that was definitely the one I felt the smartest. Yeah, uh, I think the funniest for, for me personally was probably there was a gentleman named uh, Dong Zhao who helped create several tokens. He worked for a company called Renrenbit. He was a Chinese national, kind of globetrotting around, making millions and millions of dollars on, on, his, uh, on his cryptocurrency exchange. He also was working a lot with Bitfinex, helping them create some of their, their tokens, helping to create something called Tether Yuan. So he was kind of a pivotal uh, leader in the space back in 2018. Um, and I basically told him, uh, he, he said, I'm gonna be going back to China soon. And I said to him, I think that's a very bad idea because you're gonna go to jail. Uh, you shouldn't do that. And he was like, you're an idiot. He responded to me and said I was an idiot. And then he went back to China and he ended up in jail. So he's sitting in a jail cell now, as far as I know. Damn, uh, okay. <laughs> I, I don't know why that's funny, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, to each their own, I suppose. Um, so. One of, the, one of the things that we address at some length in the Crypto Crooks podcast is that the fraud that happens in the space is actually most of the time not just down to a malicious founder. Um, and there are also venture capitalists who play a role intentionally or not in a lot of these things. And one of the most interesting things that I learned from Hyung Suk talking to him was sort of the role that venture capitalists played even inside Terraform Labs in frankly silencing critics. Can you talk about that for a bit? Yeah, so sure. From the insiders, I heard that the second largest account that actually deposited an anchor was uh, hashed and that venture capital was actually making up the TVL, I believe. 
And even in that uh, prosecution report, it writes that a certain VCs, even though they claim as like a victim, they were able to earn an enormous amount of profit. So I believe that that VC, I'm not sure if it's hash, but like some, some of them are let's actually- Let's not speculate too yeah, much. Let's not speculate too much. Yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, okay. But um, no, they may act like a victim, but they were actually like the, the guy who profited from the Ponzi scheme. And, and to be clear, that, that's because uh, these VCs don't have lockups on their tokens and were able to sell at the top of the market before the crash. Yes, uh, that's true. Yeah. So basically, I think it's like one of the problems of VCs in crypto right now. I think VCs are now not really kind of focusing on the revenue that the crypto project is bringing, but instead they only try to focus on the when lockup will be disabled and then they can actually sell the token so that they can immediately bring back the money to the LPs. So I'm saying that, oh, we just 10x or we just like 100x or something. Yeah. Um, but you specifically, and this is in the show, you, you heard people citing venture capitalists as a reason that you as a builder should not be asking difficult questions about the protocol itself. Like the big names that were backing Go. Oh, yeah. So, um, so here's the thing. So as VCs have a money, so much power in, uh, in this. Uh, so like here's a Korea. So we in Korea, there's only biggest crypto VCs out there called hash, but then they have so much power and they have so much resources. So those who are hired in these Korean blockchain companies have to watch out because if these VCs do not like them, they cannot pretty much get another job in Web3 because uh, most of the projects or most of the companies or the connected with those VCs are going to pretty much going to reject him. Yeah. So. I was not the case, to be honest, uh, like, because I'm pretty much good at English, so I could actually meet the Web3 recruiters out there and then free to get a job, but not for those native Koreans who are just kind of believes that this Web3 could actually free them, but it wasn't actually not. Like, it's basically their jobs, their lives are basically on the not VC's control. Yeah. Wow, that's bleak. I think we're going to go into kind of a bit of a more free-for-all segment here. And what I want is just, I want to discuss and, and have ideas. We're all people who have, have seen red flags and acted on it. So I just want to hear from everybody, like, what are the, the red flags that you've seen out there? What do you look out for? And particularly, I think, you know, not that there's a dichotomy, but just for example, you know, are you looking more at fiscal details at um, financial engineering, or is it more holistic stuff like character, like self-presentation, like communication? Cash, you look like you're on the edge of your seat. Well, I, I think that you're, I, you, you, I, you probably know that the answer is somewhere in between, right? Like it's not gonna be one or the other. Um, I think a prime example of this would be Celsius, where I was calling that out almost from day one, because when you looked at the APR that they, uh, APR that they were offering and the interest rate that they were offering on their, uh, the yields that they were offering on, on holding their coin, on staking their coin, on using their platform, it was obscene. Like you're talking about 20% yields, you're talking about 25% yields. That doesn't make any sense when you look at what you get when you put money in your bank, right? But then also you can look at the founder, you can look at Alex Mashinsky, and he's making these insane claims on his website where he's like, I invented voice over internet protocol like i invented things that he definitely did not invent like 100 percent, you can look at it and be like oh this guy's just creating a fictional universe where he made up all this all these amazing products so yes there's the obvious stuff where you can look at at rates you can look at how the platform is run and the promises they're making but you obviously have to look at the people in charge too and i think do kwan another good example of that for me Often when I start to get into like the specific financial mechanisms and stuff, it's because there was some other red flag that prompted me to go there. So like in the case of Terra, it was this extravagant promise of this 20% yield. And as soon as you scratch that a little bit, you see that Terraform Labs is paying to refill the yield reserve. And then in order to do that, they're continuing to like sell Luna. And so then from there, once I start to see this little bit of inconsistency, I go a little bit further and you see like the promised transparency around the Project Dawn unlocks, for example, and the reports that never came on those. And then that's a red flag, because now there's, like I've got this example of a public statement being made and not followed through on, and so that's when I generally find it worthwhile 
to begin digging into the more financial side and like looking at the actual mechanisms. And that for me is more about like proving out that it's a scam or fraud. Like after you've identified the red flags, that's where you really start to dig in and go, yeah, this part does not work and cannot work. That, that's a really good point that you do have to dig further. And, and I also, I think you identified something that a lot of people will just hand wave very quickly, which is, you know, public statements that are not followed through on. And I think the current owner of Twitter has, uh, has done that a few times. Um, and uh, I think that's also an example of people, you know, maybe not seeing that red flag willfully. Um, Jungs, whether Lunar or anything else, just in general, in, in crypto, what have you found has been bad signs? So another bad sign. Uh... Let's talk about the basis cash uh, before USD has been launched. So there was a time when Duquan was just looks so sad and just starts to like yell at his monitor saying the Ampleport is scam or base money is scam. And then uh, I was wondering what they were doing and pretty sure he was researching on algorithmic stablecoin. And then he proposed like an internal hackathon. So at that time I was you know, I was complaining so hard on Anchor and Mirror that it could not be sustainable. Maybe just working on just for a day to make a product would actually satisfy me actually working here. So I just kind of accepted that. But when I made the basis cash as what he says from the basis white paper, I found out that there's a certain problem where... That's one way to put it. Yeah, that's... Uh, <laughs> we know the whole story, but yeah. Um, <laughs> well, we yeah, I told about that problem, but then he th he told me that like oh uh, he he didn't really said anything about it, but then he just came in and suddenly came in and says like we're trying to make a recursive real farm like what is like so what he actually did on building this basis cash was that he was trying to draw some yield farm where you stake basis cash, you get basis share, you get basis sh share, and then you get basis cash, and, and, and then he was just trying to like sort of trying to find a way just to trap uh, users' money instead of just thinking about the sustainability at all. So uh, after hearing those, like, I was like, oh, no, 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 shit. I'm not going to launch this. So I just told the other teams that I'm not going to be involved in this and it just didn't do that. But after two months, they launched the basis cash with UI because um, one of the existing team members just couldn't even write a UI, so they had to do something. So after watching that, I was like, oh, what happened? And then, um, so I was always asking, so did you solve the problem where basis cash would actually eventually just increase and then you did not think about um, contracting its supply? Uh, but they say that they didn't even, they didn't even launch it because the founder was Anon at that time, but uh, I, I always knew who well, it was. Yeah. Sorry to interject, but basis cash is just such a funny example to me because like the basis team had already recognized that problem and decided not to launch. Like when you guys were working on basis cash. Oh, wow. So yeah, I remember what Dokuan was saying that we're going to rebuy this basis and we call it basis cash. Oh, sh well, um, yeah, that's stupid. Yeah. <laughs> That, that is really stupid. Why would he actually say that? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> uh, so that guy. Yeah, he was always a problem and just said uh, after like basis cash was going well, um, he said he just had a medium article called announcing UST, you know, UST is faster than die uh, without even thinking about the risk and anything. And then I was like saying when, when I watched that, I was like, this is the most prolonged exit scam. And they were like, the employees were there like, oh, you're just from like an unknown university when this guy's from Stanford or like, you know, this guy's from like, uh, well, you graduated from like whatever, like, you know, that Daniel Shin is backing it. And like, I kept telling this to the other employees when I got out of the company, but these employees were saying that I'm going to sell my body because those guys are going to be rich and maybe I'll be rich too. And, and getting rich is definitely one way to so, or the promise of getting rich is definitely one way to kind of silence criticism and attract people to you. But Do Kwan and you mentioned Alex Mashinsky both also have um, or had pretty intense cults of personality around them. And in Do Kwan's case, it was, you know, this like relentless bullying online, a little bit of that from Mashinsky as well. I guess I'm just curious for everybody's take on why 
um, at the risk of being you know, condescending, why a lot of retail crypto investors are so attracted to this particular personality type and, and also maybe why that personality type that's so confrontational, so loud, so ugly, also sometimes doesn't run the most clean projects. I, I mean, I think it's not just, it's, we're talking about confidence, right? So we're talking about, I mean, that's literally what a con man is. Confidence so, game. So yeah, uh, we're talking about this exceedingly confident person. And we can look at, I, I, if you look at someone like SBF, like he also had this confidence. I remember hearing, I don't remember if it was, uh, no names, uh, some VC firm just saying like, oh, it's so incredible that SBF is playing video games while he's having these meetings with us. And I remember thinking, why is that incredible? Like, don't you want his attention? Don't you want him to be paying attention to you and answering your questions? And I, I was like, oh, I guess not. Um, but I think what happens is then you start getting all of these venture capitalists, hedge funds, et cetera. And once they're backing you, why wouldn't retail be like, oh, that's a trusted, all these trusted moneyed people are backing this person. So why wouldn't they jump in? I think the other part of it too is so much of crypto is filled with ambiguity and uncertainty. Like many of the most interesting questions in crypto, at least to me, like the long-term security budget of Bitcoin are still active questions with like debate around them. And like that's on the most serious projects. There's still these fundamental debates. And so when you have these people with this confidence, they present this world without that ambiguity, without that confusion. And so if you're a person who's been mired in that confusion, it feels like a clear path. It feels like this person has seen the thing that I've been trying to see, and this is my way to get there. I think we are just about out of time here, so I will thank my panelists. I will quickly put out a plug for Crypto Crooks again, the podcast. Uh, I, I say without any humility that it is really good. And also, I will mention, if you are uh, you know, uh, whether you're a protocol or whatever kind of project with a, uh, with a media budget and would be interested in working with us, please get in touch. Uh, we do have some opportunities there. Any, any last couple of words, anybody wants to chime in to, you know, what, what would you say to people who are trying to not get ripped off? What's the like five words? I do your own research. I don't, <laughs> don't say that. Come on, man. Don't trust verify. <laughs> A little I, I, better. We're, we're being glib, but like, I, we were talking about this backstage, the three of us before we came out here, in that like, grifters are going to try to grift, fraudsters are going to try to commit fraud. The best thing you can do is try to go into as many of these things as you can with like, a baseline level of skepticism and willingness to kind of pay attention to what is being said and not just how it's being said. Yeah, be skeptical out there, people. Thanks everybody for coming and thanks to my panelists and uh, thank you all for being at Consensus 2023. We love you.